Hi, it's me again, Antonio D'Amico, and this is D&D with a twist. I take a D&D thing, maybe it's a class, maybe it's a monster, maybe it's a race, maybe... Maybe it's Maybelline. It's like your mom deciding to switch one ingredient in something she's prepared a thousand times and then expectantly asking you if you notice something different about whatever she made. Except here, I'm the mom, and you better compliment my cooking, you rude little boy. So when I think of Celestials, I think of... Celestials are the monsters for people with Catholic guilt and a superiority complex. It feels sort of weird to call Celestials monsters. They are divine entities that are, generally, most of the time, always in service of a god and are, generally, most of the time, always good. Let's just get into it, you'll see. In the Forgotten Realm, Celestials are extraplanar, meaning they are not from this world, like fiends, fey, and whatever's going on in the Shadowfell. <laughs> Now, it's very much not clear, but some sources say that all Celestials come from what's called the Upper Plains. Oh god, I gotta explain the planes now. So, just like our world, the world of D&D is also flat. Once you yeah. go flat, you can't go back. Everything is a plane. The material plane is where people live. It's the baseline, the real world. Surrounding the material plane, there are other planes. Entirely too many planes to get into this video. There are the elemental planes, like the plane of Earth, Wind, and Fire. <laughs> and planes like the Feywild or the Shadowfell that are basically Renfair and Emo mirrors of the Material Plane respectively. There are also the Alignment Planes, planes that embody a particular D&D alignment like Chaotic Good, True Neutral, or Lawful Evil. The Good Planes are called the Upper Planes, while the Evil Planes are called the Lower Planes, and the Neutral Planes are not called anything because nobody cares about them. Celestials are supposed to come from here. Let's take a look at some Celestials to see what we have to deal with here. Unicorns are the most iconic fantasy thingy that is also a Celestial. Much the delight of horse girls and the three bronies that are still holding on. Despite being celestials, they are not often seen as servants of any god, and would rather just vibe in whatever government-mandated magical forest they live in. Nearly every single fantasy trope ever related to unicorns applies in D&D. Impervious to poison, hide in the forest, intelligent and capable of speech, horn is used to heal basically anything, you get it. The only thing that doesn't seem to get a mention is that thing about unicorns only liking virgins, which... Good. Glad that's not on the stat block. Where were you when I was new? When I was one of those innocent young maidens you always come to? How dare you? In combat, they are annoying. They get a bunch of heals, the ability to teleport, a plus 10 to stealth, the ability to entangle anyone, and a way to increase their AC. What are you gonna do about it? Huh? Huh? What are you gonna do? Basically, everything in this stat block screams that it's meant to be an NPC that the party speaks to rather than fight it. It's either that or unicorns being the world's most annoying mount. Oh, and the Pegasus is also a Celestial. It's literally a horse with wings. There's absolutely nothing special about it. Moving on, next up are Kirin, or Kirin, apparently in D&D. Why do they spell it with a hyphen? I have never seen that romanization of the word. They are based on Chinese myth, and are just generally better than unicorns in every possible way. In D&D, they are often servants of gods, but seem to have far more free will than the other celestial servants. They are generally described as deer-like, but it's better to say that they have the body of a deer, but covered in scales. They also tend to share a lot of characteristics of East Asian and particularly Chinese dragons, with horns similar to antlers, thick head of hair and beard, and the mouth of a lion or a serpent. In Chinese myth, Kirins show up as omens of good things to come. They are associated with good fortune, fertility, and just general prosperity, and only appear in places ruled by wise rulers. So of course there are like a dozen and a half recountings of Chinese emperors swearing that a Kirin appeared to them to let them know they were doing amazing, sweetie. Kirin are not about staying in whatever stinky forest unicorns are hanging out in. They would rather visit those that are worthy and bring good things their way. They are however very much not pushovers and can perform a divine vibe check to instantly know if you are wicked. In which case, they'll breathe fire and destroy you instantly. D&D translates this by making the Kirin a CR-12 creature, so good luck fighting one. The Kirin having spells like True Resurrection and Greater Restoration screams, I am an NPC that shows up to help. So unless you're playing an evil PC, you'll rarely fight one. Speaking of which, Kirin are known to be righteous and to instantly know if someone is guilty of a crime. Electric chair. So, you know, 
dropping one to challenge into the one evil PC and hell, maybe even offer them a Celestial Warlock deal if they change their ways. That sounds pretty sweet. And finally, Davis. Divas are just straight up angels. As a matter of fact, they are literally part of a type of Celestial called angels. They look like impossibly beautiful humans apparently, with big white wings. They are also described as averse to clothing, which is a funny way of saying nudist, and their skin and hair color has changed so much that it's basically just whatever at this point. Devas and angels in general are the counterpart to devils. Just like all devils are aligned evil, all devas are aligned good. There are several types of devas. Movanic devas are just your run-of-the-mill deva that fights against the forces of evil. Very angel-themed Powerpuff Girl. Monadic devas are more servants of gods, rarely leaving their gods' domain and astral devas are the most powerful and generally spend their time going down to hell to bother devils and demons. This does not translate into different stat blocks, and the differences between them are not super clear. They all do different flavors of the same thing, the only ones really standing out from the rest being astral devas. There's also no hierarchy between the different orders, which is a shame. That could be interesting. Oh, and a footnote here. If when I said Deva, you immediately thought, oh, Hinduism. I'm sorry to tell you that they have absolutely nothing to do with Hindu Devas. These are just straight up Catholic angels, down to the way they look. No idea why they went with that name. In combat, Devas are a chunky CR-10. Don't let the short stat block fool you, though. They basically have their own version of a druid's wild shape, but they are able to turn into any beast or humanoid below their CR. What the? While in their new form, they get all the abilities of whatever they transformed into. So have fun running that. Hope you like carrying stat blocks. A cool side effect of this though, is that you can do the Christmas movie cliche. You know the one where like the very sweet homeless person is actually a deva in disguise and they show the meaning of Christmas to the lady with the big job in the big city. That one. That's a neat idea for a Hallmark themed holiday one shot. So much to do one of those. Me. I'm someone. There are other angels aside from Davis, like Solars and Planetars, but those are basically the same thing as a Deva, but stronger and bolder. So yeah, those are honestly a good chunk of Celestials. They are really, really not that many, huh? Okay, if you haven't picked up on it by now, here's the problem with Celestials. There's extremely little information on them and basically nothing about them is set in stone in canon. Sometimes Celestials come from the upper planes, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're always good and sometimes they aren't. Sometimes Sometimes they are servants of gods and sometimes they're not. We've had a whole bunch written about devils, but nothing about celestials. So what are we to do? Well, we rely on the tried and true method of make shit up personal interpretation. It seems to me that all celestials are in some way divine, but not all of them serve a god. It seems to me like an angel is just a category that includes servants of gods, and that the angels change depending on what god they serve. And I suppose that's all well and good, but what if we gave celestials a new twist? So you want to fight a celestial. He's looking at me like he's staring, and he says, Hi, Jamie. And I said, Hi? I look at my wife, I said, that was an angel of God. Celestials are divine beings that are all about good vibes only and will bring down the sword of thy maker if thou darest disturb these most holy vibes of good. I think there's some insane potential in Celestials as a concept, particularly those that serve the gods. But before I get into it, let me do a little disclaimer. Many Celestials in D&D do follow the sort of modern Catholic idea of angels, but there are many other cultural inspirations used with Celestials in D&D, like the East Asian Kirin, the Aztec Coatl, or the Unicorn of Horse Girl mythology. However, I come from a culture influenced by Catholic mythos, and when it comes to my work, I think it's better to draw from my own culture and let the people from other cultures decide how. And if they want to include celestials of their own mythologies, cultures, and religions in the game. This means the celestials I make here will be based off of the Catholic idea of angels. I'm not aware of other 5e indie designers creating celestials based on their own cultures, but if you know some, hit me up on Twitter. I would love to see that and give it a shout out. So what does that mean? Well, get ready because I plan to utilize a dark, powerful ability. I'm busting out the Catholic guilt. That's right, we're finally giving the people what they want, and we're going full biblical angel here. You're telling me this is a fantasy world where you can kill God and angels look like this and not like this? <laughs> No, 
we're changing it. For this twist on Celestials, I'm taking Christian Angelology as a basis, but I'm making many, many changes to make it work in D&D. This is not about being faithful to the source material. <laughs> Get it? Faithful. Anyway, the point is not to take biblical angels and put them as is in D&D, but rather to make a system of angels that works with D&D cosmology based on biblical angels. Because I got good grades at school as a kid, and now if I don't suffer and make things hard for myself, I feel lazy. Anyway, let's get to it. So in my version of angels, an angel is basically a divine construct created by a god for a clear purpose. They don't have thoughts and feelings of their own. They believe whatever the god that created them believes. They aren't people, they are angels, and those two are very different. These angels are organized around their god in what is called an angelic court. An angelic court is basically a hierarchy of angels. This hierarchy is divided in three spheres, with three different types of angels in each one. Side note here, if you're like me and hate alignment, you can make it so that every lawful god gets angels, or basically every god that has their shit together enough to put a hierarchy of heavenly temp workers in place. Angels themselves have no morals of their own, they just follow what their god think is best, so they don't have to be good. Each god's angelic court looks different, because each god's angels look different. A god of storms will have angels with a thunder motif, a god of death will have like spooky angels with skeletal wings and hyper-realistic blood eyes, you get it. Despite all of them looking different, they all follow the same basic template, and one clear rule. The closer an angel has to work with mortals, the more they look like them. Since they are the ones making contact with actual people the most often, they have been designed to look the most like people so that, you know, they don't run away from the angel in fear as soon as the angel shows up. Okay, let's go into the spheres. The third sphere. The third sphere is the lowest sphere. And the best way to explain it is by using customer service jobs. Because what better way to explain heaven than through hell on earth? First up, angels. Angels are your regular employees of heaven. Cashiers, grill team members, drive through order takers, Stephanie, the security guard with the wonky leg and the kind smile. You get it. They are the lowest of celestials in the employ of a god. Angels look like the most basic idea of an angel. An adult with smaller white wings and a simple golden halo. The details of their actual appearance vary depending on who is looking at them. Angels appears as whatever the person that sees them considers beautiful and awe-inspiring. So things like gender, clothing, or hair color differ depending on who is seeing the angel. Two people could be looking at the same exact angel and see a completely different person standing in front of them. Their task is simple. They help specific people their god would want to help and deliver messages. If a divine power needs to deliver a message to a mortal, they use an angel to do it. Guardian angels are a subset of these, and guardian angels tend to be the easiest angels to corrupt and become falling angels for two reasons. First, angels being the lowest in the angelic hierarchy means they have the least amount of divinity in them, which means they are the closest to developing actual feelings of all angels. Secondly, they spend a lot of time with one specific mortal, so they are most likely to go against the wishes of their god to protect them and stop them from doing mortal things like, you know, dying. On the other side of the coin, they could grow so disgusted by the mortal they are watching over that they decide to make the whole mortal part of being mortal go, you know, a little bit faster. Unsurprisingly, guardian angels are where most Asimar come from. Archangels are the managers of the great Costco that is heaven. They oversee groups of people, like settlements, towns, and cities, and the angels below them. Since these are also likely to appear in front of people, they don't look that different from angels. The main difference is being their glowing skin, a halo much larger than the ones of angels, and their wings, which are twice the length of their body. Aside from watching over groups of people, archangels are also foot soldiers in whatever divine war their god is currently fighting. If it's Tuesday, angels and devils are fighting, again, and the troops on the angels side are archangels, which is why they often carry swords and other weapons. And finally for the third sphere, principalities. Principalities are the highest angels of the third sphere. They oversee entire nations. They only appear in front of heads of state and other rulers. Otherwise, they spend most of their time guiding angels and archangels and assigning them tasks, taking their rightful place as a regional manager of heaven. They are also the point of connection between the second sphere and the third. If the second sphere needs something from the third, they'll tell principalities. Because principalities have to appear in front of rulers, their appearance has to command Respect. They look regal and imposing, with beautiful gowns or shining armors depending on what will make the ruler they're talking to listen. Their wings are not made of feathers and their halos are not made of gold, but rather of pure radiant energy, like light given form. If they're talking to a royal, they will have a shining crown of light suspended above their heads. 
The second sphere. This is where it gets funky. The second sphere governs the building blocks of creation. This heavily depends on what god they serve. A god of Arcana will have celestials in the second sphere that oversee how Arcana flows in the world and such. Because they rarely, if ever, interact with mortals, their appearance starts to get extremely weird. First up, authorities. They fight whatever the god they serve under considers evil. If they serve a god of nature, authorities will fight forces that seek to destroy nature. This means that it's actually common for authorities of one god to fight the authorities of another. Appearance-wise, they sort of retain a humanoid shape, but their entire body is made for battle. They are never doing anything other than fighting, so they don't have hands, their arms just end in the weapons that they use for combat. They don't have skin or flesh, they're just completely made out of metal and covered in heavy armor. And their wings are not made of white feathers, but of blades. If an authority appears in front of a mortal, it's to fight it, so they are not very concerned with looking non-threatening. And finally, for the second sphere, virtues. The opposite of authorities, they cultivate and help grow whatever their god considers most important. If they serve a god of harvest, they ensure that harvest cycles continue as they should. Since virtues embody what a god cares for, they are made to look like the embodiment of whatever the virtue takes care of. For example, a virtue of a harvest god will have hair made out of wheat and four different faces, one for each season of the harvest. They are beautiful, but also very alien, barely humanoid. Virtues are also tasked with delivering prayers to their specific gods, so prayers for a bountiful harvest will reach a virtue first, which will then deliver that to the first sphere where their god resides. This makes virtues prime target for fallen angel syndrome, since they might decide that since they are the ones doing the actual work of their god, why shouldn't they just be the god instead? What's so great about Caesar? Yeah. Brutus is just as cute as Caesar. Okay, Brutus is just as smart as Caesar. People totally like Brutus just as much as they like Caesar. And when did it become okay for one person to be the boss of everybody, huh? Because that's not what Rome is about! We should totally just stab Caesar! When they're set on this plan, they secretly amass some of the prayers for themselves, growing in power until they are powerful enough to challenge their god, or powerful enough to flee the angelic court. This rarely ends well for them, but when is it a good idea for an angel to have a thought of their own? It's also a good way to have your players feel like they're fighting and killing a god without, you know, actually having them fight and kill a god. And finally, the first fear. This is the last sphere of an angelic court. The first sphere is reserved for angels in direct contact with their god. These are the heavenly servants of divinity. They rule over all angels, and since they're basically never seen by mortals, they get spooky. First up, thrones. Thrones are called thrones because they are literally the foundation in which their god lives. That's right, the house of god is itself an angel. In battles between gods, thrones become actual living, moving fortresses. Sentient, scary, and impenetrable. The only way to destroy a throne is to destroy their core, hidden deep within the house of their god. The core looks like a sphere made out of interlocking rings and wheels, and each one of those rings are lined with eyes that never blink so that the core of the throne may never be taken taken by surprise by assailants. So you know, cute. And finally, Seraphim. Seraphim are the most powerful angels in the angelic court. Their name literally means the burning ones, and they live up to that name by being a set of disembodied wings covered in eyes and engulfed in fire, with the face of their god at the center. Just girly things. Seraphim have two jobs. The first one is to sing the prayers the god receives, giving them more power. Their song is impossible for anyone but the god to understand, even if the listener can speak celestial. A truly haunting melody. Their second task is to defend the house of their god. Seraphim are extremely powerful in combat, but they rarely need to do anything at all when they find an intruder. They are what happens when an angel is not made to be seen by mortals. They are literally designed to be impossible to witness in a Lovecraftian sort of way. If a mortal sees a seraph with their naked eyes and they are not strong enough to withstand their presence, the mortal is instantly enveloped in flames. Even an angel of the third sphere could die by looking at a seraph in the eye. Or the eyes. I guess. Those mortals that somehow survive an encounter with a seraph are never the same, unable to stop thinking about the appearance of the seraph, and unable to stop hearing the seraph's song. So there you go! Those are the angelic courts! I think the difference between each sphere and each angel within that sphere are clear, and I also think that each angel here could be the center of an adventure of your party. Maybe one member of your party meets their guardian angel, who is trying to escape their angelic court because they've gained sentience after following the party for so long. Maybe the party stumbles onto a village that believes they worship a god that has come into the material plane, only to find out that it's a virtue that believes itself to be superior than the god that created them, and now is accumulating 
prayers to ascend to godhood. Maybe the party wants to kill a god and they have to infiltrate the throne where the god lives and destroy the core. Sounds pretty cool. It's a shame that all of this is just lore. So you will have to come up with your own stat blocks and legendary actions and battle tactics for all of them and... Oh wait, what's that over there? Is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it's three full stat blocks for three of the angelic court angels I created. That's right, the angel, the authority, and the seraph are all getting their own stat blocks. I thought that these would be the most likely to be encountered by a party in a combat situation, so I made the stat blocks for them. Each stat block also includes battle tactics that help you run them in combat to really challenge your players. So go out there and become the JRPG protagonist that you were meant to be all along and kill God. And welcometh mine childreneth to thine endeth of thy videoeth. This was a long one, but I hope it was worth it. Ever since I started this series, I've wanted to give a twist to Celestials. I guess it's all those JRPGs I played as a kid because I really, really like the idea of Celestials and I was so frustrated by how little we know about them and how few there are in D&D. So making a whole hierarchy of angels was at the very top of my list. The Seraph is also my first CR20 monster, so please be kind. Oh, and speaking of which, I am working on some tweaks to content I've already released in other videos, so you know, keep an eye out on that. Or whatever. We'll see. Honestly, I would love to revisit this idea in the future and maybe flesh out the rest of the Angelic Court. Maybe even make some adventures themed around them. And I was really serious about that holiday one-shot. I don't know, man. I just love angels. <laughs> Anyway, as always, I really, really hope this doesn't come off as disingenuous because I really do mean it. Thank you so much for the support. We have grown an insane amount. I've been talking with like YouTube adjacent people, like people that do YouTube, and yeah, they were very surprised that we're this far along so quickly. And that's thanks to y'all because I couldn't, <laughs> I can't subscribe to my own channel. I've tried. So yeah, thank you. And if you want to, that'd be nice. Keep commenting, subscribing, doing the thing. I don't know. You know what to do. This is not your first time watching a YouTube video, I hope. If it is, you picked the right one. That's enough outro for today. Love y'all, brush your teeth, buy local and in-season produce, and be nice. Mwah!